Hey y'all, Coach Unify here, looking at comments and trying to clear up yet another misunderstanding that's floating around the church these days. This one is concerning Noah and the 150 days that the water was upon the earth during the flood. Now, I'm prompted to do this video based on a comment on a video that I produced a few days ago about Noah. In that video, I used the book of Jubilees and the book of Genesis to show that the sacred calendar months are to start on the new moon. Maybe I'll put those two verses up side by side so you can see the scriptural evidence I used to prove that the new moon indicates the new month. Now, if you're new to our channel, it may seem odd to you we stick so strictly to the scripture. I would like to say that I'd never go outside of the scripture when I make statements. I mean, I may think certain things, but if I can't back it up with a scripture, then I won't say it. This often leads to debates in the comment sections of the videos because a lot of other people in the world will make assumptions. And some of these people expect everybody to just go along with their assumptions, which a lot of times they sound good. But... On this channel and in this ministry, we have to use scripture. The viewers that have been around my channel for a long time will take an assumption and roll it up and beat you with it. If you can't provide the verse to back up what you're saying. So anyway, let's come in here and let's look at this comment from a guy that I'm just going to call K. He starts off saying, it amazes me how different preachers are trying so hard to convince their own reckoning of time. Now, of course, he's talking about me because he made this comment on a video in which I was proving the start of the sacred month. But why is he saying that I'm trying to convince my own reckoning of time? It's not my reckoning of time. It's what the scripture says. The new moon equals the new month. When you put these two scriptures together, understanding that the word of God is infallible and that there are no mistakes in it, it's easy to see that the new moon is the same as the new month. He goes on to say that the scripture says that Noah had entered the ark on the 17th day of the second month. Now where he's getting this from is Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11. It says, in the 600th year of Noah in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same were all the waters of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Now, it doesn't say that Noah entered the ark on that date. If you don't remember the story, you can look in verse 10 and see that Noah actually entered the ark seven days earlier. What verse 11 is saying is that on the 17th day of the second month is when the rains started. This may be a slight oversight on his part, but like mathematics, small errors can lead to big problems. But anyway, let's go on. He says, and the ark rested on Mount Ararat on the 17th day of the seventh month. Now that he has stated correctly from Genesis chapter 8 in verse 4 where it says and the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat he says and the waters returned from off the earth continually and after the end of the hundred and fifty days the waters were abated and the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat which we find also in verse 3 along with verse 4. What this is talking about is how after the fountains of the deep had broken up, the water covered the earth for 150 days before the ark rested in the seventh month and on the 17th day of the month. Okay, so we have no problem with that. So let's go on with this comment. He says, from the above verses, it's clearly seen that Noah was keeping records of the days. Because it says after 150 days, Ark rested. He was not watching a moon to find out what month it is. Okay, now this right here is what we were talking about. People making assumptions. 
the Bible never says that Noah was keeping the record of days but notice how he said from the above verses is clearly seen it's not clearly seen it's assumed that he was keeping a record of days and is actually a false assumption Noah didn't write the book of Genesis Moses did it is also a common misunderstanding based on assumptions that the story of Moses was actually passed down from one generation to another people assume that Moses got the information from his forefathers who had gotten their information from forefathers before them this actually adds to the idea that the scripture is fallible and it would be full of errors if you consider the fact that those people were in Egypt for almost 200 years before Moses was adopted and raised by Pharaoh so here you would have Moses who is more Egyptian than he is Israelite at that point receiving historical facts from people who have been enjoying the Egyptian culture for over 200 years and then if you back up to the time before Egypt there's nothing that states that Abraham Isaac and Jacob had memorized the historical facts in order to pass down to the Israelites hoping that it would get to Moses one day when he would actually be able to write it down in a book not to mention how Abraham was actually raised by a pagan father could you imagine how many errors would be in this scripture if it had actually transpired like that have you ever played that game called grapevine where you're given a statement to tell another person and they are to tell another person and they are to pass it on to another person until it eventually gets back to you and you see if the statement is the same as what it started off with well imagine that grapevine lasting for thousands of years no like we said that is an incorrect assumption and to prove this fact we're going to come over to the book of Jubilees in chapter 1 you see in verse 3 it says and he called to Moses on the seventh day out of the midst of the cloud and the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a flame and fire on the top of the mount this is what you read about over there in the book of Exodus and I think chapter 24 or maybe 25 when Moses is about to go up on the mountain for 40 days and receive the Torah or the law we see that mentioned in verse 4 when he says and Moses was on the mount 40 days and 40 nights and God taught him the earlier and latter history of the division of all the days of the law and of the testimony and of the testimony this is how Moses got the information for the book of the Torah it wasn't passed down from his forefathers he was taught this information on Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb over the span of about 40 days was he given that information from the Elohim directly so in our previous assumption scenario we imagined how many errors would be in the Torah if it had been passed down from the forefathers well look at how accurate it actually is knowing that it was passed down from our father directly that makes you think about that jot and tittle and how every one of them would have been correct but anyway back over here to Kay's comment he's using his assumption and his own misunderstandings to discredit the lunar calendar he uses three exclamation points as he says and he was not watching a moon to find out what month it is so his assumption in no way discredits the lunar calendar at all so let's go on because a lot of people actually use this to discredit the scripture he says 100 days equals five months and that makes one month equal 30 days not 29 days as the moon shows not 28 but exactly 30 days per month 
Okay, now as I stated, and I will continue to state, that the scripture is actually perfect to the letter and to the day. And many people have struggled with this same concept for many, many years. Many of whom had no faith in the infallibility of the scripture. And some actually wanted to discredit the scripture altogether. So we're going to use scripture to make sense of the 150 days equals five months. Now, when it comes to the lunar months, we see that some months have 30 days in them and some months have 29 days in them. And certain months like Bull or Heshvan and Keshlu can have 29 days or 30 days, depending on what year it is. So let's create us a table and see if this will actually work out. I actually created two tables, one that starts with Nisan being the first month of the year and another table with Tishri being the first month of the year. And I spanned it out to look at what would happen over 19 years, because we know that after 19 years, everything starts to repeat itself. Now, the information in this table is calculated with the program that I'm using. But you see that it shows that Tishri has 30 days in it for all 19 years. And that's the same thing we saw over here at this table we got from Google says that Tishri has 30 days in it. Same thing with our other table. Nissan has 30 days consistently. So we're going to go with the table that starts with Tishri because we see that it wasn't until Moses' time that Nissan or Abib became the first month. We see that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2. So with Tishri being at the first month, that would make Bull or Heshvan the second month. So we're going to start at Heshvan 17 as day one. Because in Genesis chapter 7 and 11, it says the same day were all of the fountains of the deep broken up. So the water was actually on the face of the earth on the 17th, making the 17th day one. So then we're going to simply count down to see where we end up in day 150. For most years, we end up on Nisan 18. In some years, we end up in the 13th month and the 17th day. But the scripture didn't say five months later, which would have been perfect. It actually said the seventh month, which, as you see, is about a day off. So in other words, if we start off in the second month on the 17th day of the month and count exactly 150 days, we end up on the seventh month and the 18th day of the month. So you say, well, where is that other day? If you like me, you expect it to be absolutely perfect. So let's go back and let's look closer at the scripture. It was the water that was abated for 150 days we see that in verse 3 and then in verse 4 we see that the ark rested on the 17th day of the seventh month which would actually be a day earlier so how is it that the ark rested a day earlier than the 150 days now, before I show you that solution, let's come over and let's look at the book of Jubilees, chapter 5, which talks about the same events. You see in verse 27, it says, And the waters prevailed on the face of the earth five months, 150 days. Again, so it's talking about the waters. In verse 28, it says, And the ark went and rested on the top of Lober, one of the mountains of Ararat. So I came over to Wikipedia to look up Mount Ararat and apparently it has two big mountains. One they call Greater Ararat and one called Little Ararat. Greater Ararat is at an elevation of 17,000 feet while Little Ararat is at 13,000 feet. Then it says, and on the new moon of the seventh month, all of the mouths of the abyss of the earth were opened and the water began to descend into the deep. So what you could imagine is that there's Noah out there floating around on this water, but he has no way of knowing that the water actually started descending 
The same way you wouldn't know that the elevation of the water was changing if you were sitting in the middle of the ocean. But anyway, that's what it's saying is that the water actually started to decrease on the new moon of the seventh month. And we see down in verse 30 that it says, and on the new moon of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So looking back at our information about Ararat, you have the, the highest elevation at 17,000 feet. That would have been where the ark would have rested. And then as far as the tops of the mountains being seen, that would have been the other mountain, Little Ararat, at 13,000 feet. So the question is, how is it that the ark rested on Mount Ararat before the 150 days were up? From what we see in our table, it was actually one day before the 150 days were up. The ark rested on the seventh month and the 17th day of the month, and the water was abated on the 150th day. So that's clearly a difference of one day. Well, when you realize that part of the boat is actually underwater, it all makes sense. Because before Noah would realize that the water level had decreased at all, the bottom of the ship would have touched the top of the mountain. So it would have been just like in the movies where there Noah was floating around and all of a sudden he feels the ark hit land. But yet when he looks out the window, he still only sees water. And then we see that the tops of the mountains were not made visible until the 10th month. So when he looked out of the ark, all he would have seen was water for another 75 days. So using the information from Mount Ararat, understanding that the water would have abated from Great Ararat to Little Ararat for 73 days, that equates to about 55 feet of water per day. In other words, the water didn't disappear all of a sudden. So how much of the ark was underwater? Well, there's no way to know for sure, but we know it definitely wasn't zero feet. There was some of the boat that was underwater. So it was during that time that the bottom of the boat touched Ararat until the water level touched Ararat that makes up that one day difference that we see over there. Not to mention that we don't know the ex exact hour in which the ark came to rest. It could have been in the morning, but it very well could have been in the afternoon, closer to the evening. One thing for sure is that this one day is a difference of less than 24 hours, less than 24 hours. And then considering that the bottom of the ark touched the mountain before the water level did, it's not a discrepancy at all. Once again, the scripture works out perfectly. The scriptural account of the 150 days is accurate within minutes. Actually, giving credit to the fact that Noah was also using a lunar calendar. Which would have been the only calendar available to him at the time. So, we'll just let the haters hate. And nothing we can do about that. But, for the rest of us. This is yet even more scripture that proves that the Bible is actually infallible. 100% air free. 100% accurate. Down to the minute. Maybe even the second.